wonderful to see everyone uh, broadcasting in from their homes and office locations all across the north of England. And obviously, welcome to anyone who might be uh, sat at home uh, watching uh, and hope everyone, uh, with all participants and all viewers, uh, is safe and well at this time. Um, David, can I ask if we've had any apologies for today's meeting? We haven't actually had any apologies uh, noted, Chair. OK, excellent. Uh, if I can then move swiftly on to declarations of interest, which is obviously for me to remind anyone participating in today's meeting that if they do have anything to declare, either at this point or at any time during proceedings, please uh, do not hesitate to uh, digitally raise your hand uh, so we can make sure that those are recorded uh, accordingly. And equally, if I can uh, just remind everyone of the, the suitable pro protocol about muting your microphones uh, whilst um, you're not speaking and if you can use the digital hand raising facility if you want to ask a question raise a point accordingly that would be excellent the third item is the minutes of the meeting that we held in public on the 12th of March uh, can I move that those minutes are a correct uh, record um, if that's agreed I'm not seeing any dissent for that, so I'll take that as agreed uh, accordingly. And then if we can move into the main uh, substantive item, which is uh, item four, which is the rail operations and COVID-19 uh, recovery. We've got a number of people that are going to uh, say a few words and present this. Uh, and then we've got some time for questions and discussions of about half an hour. So I'm going to first ask uh, Barry White as TFN's chief executive just to say some introductory words. Barry, over to you. Thank you, Liam. I'll, I'll keep them brief till I have plenty of time for discussion. The essence of this paper is really about a balancing act. The natural enthusiasm we all have to want people to use public transport in preference to a car in normal times um, versus the need to have a, the safest way of operating properly at, at the moment as well. And uh, I think there's a lot of the good things happening in the industry at the moment that are providing that additional confidence to people. But that balancing act is going to continue for some time. And this just sets out some thinking about how that confidence can be rebuilt over time and at the appropriate time uh, as well. So that's all I want to say by way of introduction, Liam. OK, that's excellent. Thanks for that, Barry, and echo that entirely. Uh, we've got Anna-Jane Hunter from Network Rail, uh, who I think is going to say a few words on behalf of the, the industry collectively uh, on this report. So, Anna-Jane, if I can hand over to you now. Yeah, hi. So, in the interest of time, we've we've agreed that I'll just speak on behalf of myself, um, Northern and TPE. Um, I believe um, Nick Donovan's on the line for a later item, and um, I'm expecting Louise Ebbs as well. So, if there are any particular questions as we go on um, for the operators, we do have them here to answer. But by way of overview, um, the paper is is representative of where we are um, at the moment. Um, not that much different to last time we spoke to you. So, we've been working, continuing to work collaboratively, um, and um, brought together. By the North of England Contingency Group, which is still functioning really well and offering us an opportunity to come together as an industry, hear feedback from stakeholders and, and build those into our plans. And um, so those plans have seen us most recently step up on the 6th of July. Um, so the number of services that are being operated now. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, taking us to around 86% for TPE and around 67% for Northern. And that's really focused around delivering capacity into the key urban areas and continuing what we've been doing throughout the crisis in support of key worker flows. Um, and for our part on the on the network rail infrastructure side, continuing to support key freight flows as well. So those objectives um, remain and we're, and we're continuing to deliver uh, those as best we can. Demand remains low, and, and I'll leave it for the operators to, uh, to answer any specific questions on what they're seeing. But, but typically, demand still is around 15 to 20 percent of, of usual levels. Um, but we are beginning to see some more localised peaks. Um, those are quite often weather dependent, as you can imagine. So on, on weekends and, and when the sun does decide to shine on the north, then, then we do see some, some more localised peaks. But those are being managed successfully at the moment. And, and, and we haven't yet, I'm pleased to say, seen anything that we haven't been able to, to cope with. And we've been able to keep our frontline staff and our passengers safe um, at the moment in, in, in the way that they're travelling. Um, just touching on face coverings, which people may have questions about as we go on um, in the more specifics, uh, coverage, uh, use of face coverings 
it has improved and it is generally consistently quite good, but it is patchy, um, you know, areas to area and different times of the day. I think it's probably fair to say it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent in terms of compliance, um, but, but good enough levels given the passenger numbers that we're seeing. So we're, we're not finding it problematic. Looking ahead a little bit, September's the next uplift nat nationally, so there's going to be another timetable uplift in September. Northern will uplift their services a little further there, um, mainly uh, based around the resources available and also targeting school flows. So we're expecting schools to go back in September. That's really important for those local services. Um, TPE won't be stepping up any further in September. Their resource base is, is currently in the in the July change up at about 90 percent of their resource utilisation at the moment. So that's that's a good level to keep that at without risking um, the resilience of the timetable. And that's probably the, the last point that I just want to touch on, which, again, we might get into in the discussion. We've touched on it before. We're really trying to reintroduce um, levels of train service across across the industry in a controlled fashion with resilience in mind. We continue to enjoy really good levels of performance performance at the moment in the 90s um, consistently day in day out and we're trying to protect that and take as much as we can forwards as we reintroduce services so really the objective is to take that resource base see what's happening with staff availability with rolling stock with what's available from the network and reintroduce services in a controlled way so that we don't destabilize that that really successful um, picture on performance that we've got as much as possible that applies to both september and to the next major timetable change in december which we're working with uh, with the industry on at the moment to develop uh, and you'll see you'll see a paper on that later on the agenda as ever happy to take questions and as i say there's colleagues from the operators here for, for specific questions for them uh, but I know the, the value is in the discussion, so I won't talk any any further. Lovely. Thanks for that, Anna Jane. And obviously, as you said, we've also got Nick Donovan from uh, Northern and we've got Louise Ebstrom from TransPennine and, and Jerry Farkerson from TransPennine as well that can answer questions from the industry uh, side of things. And also Gary Bogan from our own team that would be able to, to answer any questions. Before I, uh, I invite uh, others in, and I'm sure there, there will be numerous ones, a question I wanted to ask, and it's probably Gary that's best placed to answer this, is there were reports in the press last week uh, that first group may cease trading because of the impact of the, the pandemic. Now, I'm certainly not here to pass comments or ask questions on the status of the company, uh, but I do want to, to ask the question about what protocols has the DFT uh, got in place uh, for operator of last resort if that scenario was to, to come into being. So, uh, Gary, are you best placed to, to answer that for us? Yes, I, I can do. Like yourself, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on, on first group but certainly in respect of the operator last resort function um i guess since covid arrived with us and we saw the drop off in passenger demand and the impact that, that will have on revenues and the fact that the emergency measures agreements uh, currently only run until september um the section 30 function as it's called the operator last resort um has been mobilized across the board because ultimately it, it could be that any number of franchises would will will um run into trouble across the piece with COVID. So um that um function is up running and, and, and active across the piece. Certainly TP is is um our focus in amongst that and, and I'm happy enough that we've got um a good feedback into the department on just what the issues and expectation time scales would be um if if first group and or TP did uh, run into trouble at any point. So um it is all uh well, in fact, we will invite Richard as well, who obviously has a, 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 um, a good stake in the operator of last resort to, to, to say that I'm, uh, I'm reflecting his position. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we've, that we've got that cover. Thank you, Gary. Liam, would you like me to comment? Absolutely, please, if you could, Richard. Uh, good really morning, helpful. everybody. Yeah, uh, no, Gary's right. Um, the operator of last resort and Section 30 arrangements are always in place. We have... Uh, a long list of franchises that we keep an eye on. Um, so whatever we read in newspapers is always very interesting, but it doesn't actually affect what we are doing because we, we have our own uh, sources of information that we watch all the time. And as Gary says, with the EMAs coming to an end in September, um, we fully expect the department to have its own arrangements to make sure that we don't have everybody falling off the edge of a cliff all at the same time, because that, that would be not good for the industry. It wouldn't be good for anybody. So, so we're, we're there and ready and waiting, but we're not the only mechanism open to the department. 
Excellent, that's great. Thanks for giving us that reassurance, Richard, that whatever happens, the railway will keep running under any circumstances. That's really, yes, really can. just helpful to, to have that on record. Uh, have we got anyone else that wants to ask any questions or make any comments at this stage? I'm just looking for um, any digital hands. Don, you, you're, uh, you want to come in. Over to you. Yes, Mr Chairman. Th thank you very much. Uh, North Yorkshire residents, uh, I think, are a little concerned about what options TPE has in place for its York to Scarborough service, uh, because we are expecting in due course the weather to get much better and uh, there to be far greater demand for travel to Scarborough. Northern, we know it has put in some service strengthening for Yorkshire coastal resorts. Uh, what does TPE have uh, in uh, planned uh, in the event that uh, business does begin to pick up very rapidly. Okay, J Jerry Louise, who wants to, to take that? Jerry, you're indicating. So. Yeah, th thank you. Um, yes, we, we introduced some additional strengthening on the Scarborough route a week or so ago, and we are regularly assessing the demand so we can move our rolling stock round. We are at this position using all our rolling stock, so it would be about reallocation. But I can assure you we are taking a very proactive view on managing the demand as it, as it arises. OK, thank you, Jerry. Brilliant. Anyone else? Heather. Um, yes, I just wondered, obviously, we welcome the northern um, uplift of the ro uh, rail from Bishop Auckland through to Saltburn, but we just wondered whether there's any chance of improving, because it's still only one train an hour from Darlington to Saltburn, and again, that's, you know, this is a, um, a coastal resort that people like to travel to, so I just wondered if there's any chance of improving that service. So, Liam, would you like me to take that? Please, if you can, Nick, that would be great. Okay. General basis, we're um, I mean, similar to, to Jerry. We are um, resource-led in terms of our approach at the moment. There's some uplifts across the network. Certainly, uh, the regional directors will be uh, covering off on a local basis the, uh, the, the details in terms of local uplifts. And um, the Saltburn, um, those services particularly we've been watching because we recognise the uh, volumes that have built um, around certainly some of the tourist uh, volumes there, so we're very conscious of the uh, the pressure on uh, on satisfying those those demands in uh, in the future uplifts. So uh, we're watching that one carefully. Thank you, Keith. Keith Little. Yeah, thank you, Chair, um, and welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm just looking at the paper and the timetable and service offer from the 6th of July, where the Secretary of State is asking the industry to work together to maximum possible uplift. And yet we're hearing that we are still running at 10 and 15% of capacity for passengers. Uh, I think the question needs to be asked, you know, that we, we need to be letting the uh, transport operators monitor, as they're saying clearly today, that the usage in certain areas will demand, you know, a service uh, extra provision. But it, it just seems to me, and I look at the trains that are running around my neck of the woods in Cumbria, uh, they're completely, they're, they're still virtually empty. My daughter went down to London on, on the weekend and travelled around London. The trains are virtually empty. The stations are empty. Um, I don't know who's going to pay for all these costs, but it's got to be tremendous. Uh, I, I think there's a difference here in what government are asking for. Uh, and what the train operators are able to provide to meet the demands of the public. Thanks, Keith. Does anyone want to respond to that, or is, are we just taking that as the, the statement that it is, which is, yeah, very true I, in the, the current circumstances? Richard? Yeah, I'll respond. I, I think um, it's a very good point, Keith. I think we are all very conscious that we are carrying around a lot of fresh air at the moment, which costs everybody a lot of money. Um, as a public transport system, as a mass transit system, we want to be carrying people. That's what we're here for. Um, but as we stand at the moment, we, we're treading that balancing act between complying with the regulations on uh, social distancing uh, and providing as much capacity as we can, uh, given that the capacity itself is constrained by by some of the resources we have available to do it. 
So the, the thing that I'm worried about for the long term, and I share your worry, Keith, about the long term finances of all this, is is the psychology of it for our customers as well. And the psychology of are they ready to come back? We want them to come back. We can't with the current social distancing. But even if we swept away all the social distancing, are they psychologically ready to come back to the railways? And I worry about that because that has a longer term implication. Andy? It's a, a quick one, Chad. I'd just be keen to hear from Richard and Jerry uh, about levels of compliance of wearing of face coverings at the moment and what uh, initiatives the operators have to improve levels of compliance, whether they have used enforcement, fines. Um, obviously, I'm dealing with the same issue on Metrolink and just wondering what, what to do. I think the more that we improve compliance across the public transport system, I think it kind of might help address the point Keith was raising around, you know, I think there are some people who, have, who are struggling with getting back on the tram, tr train or bus, aren't they? And I think if we all drive up compliance together, I think that's possibly the way to the way to go. We'd just be keen to hear any perspectives from uh, uh, Richard or Jerry or even uh, Jane. Uh, well, I'll offer mine quickly because I think it, it is it's more for the operators. But from a managed stations point of view, obviously, we share the same challenge. And I think um, for me, looking forward, consistency on the messaging is going to be really important for people. So um, what, we're, what we're seeing and hearing around face coverings in, in retail outlets, I think, might well be helpful. So at the minute, we've got a we've got a bit of a contradiction where you don't need to wear a face mask in Sainsbury's on station approach outside Piccadilly. But, but technically, you do have to wear one in the station branch of of, of Sainsbury's that's a little bit confusing I, I find that confusing as a passenger I'm sure many other people do um, when you're on the train is it different to when you're on the station so I think we, we've gone through a period of a few months where we've heard lots of changing and rapidly changing rules and regulations and that's confusing at the best of times but particularly when people are feeling nervous about things and, and and as Richard said nervous about travel in particular so as we move forward and things begin to become clearer and more consistent I, I, I do expect to see that that compliance and ability to encourage and educate uh, we really don't want to be enforcing if possible we, we want to be encouraging and, and, and educating people first of all I think that'll become easier when it's a bit more consistent. Uh, I was going to say the same thing as Anna Jane actually I think I think the uh, the change in relation to retail actually helps with our own compliance. And yet, if we can get consistency across the board between Metrolink, the railways, the buses, uh, the more the more consistency, the easier it is, I think, to get compliance. As Anna Jane says, we don't really want to be in the business of frog marching people around with policemen. We, we want people to be naturally complying, and there'll always be a few difficult people but but we need to keep those two in a minimum and not not make an issue about it, frankly absolutely and i think that's a really important point uh, andy not least because a lot of the scientific uh, studies coming out of places like japan and france are showing that you know high observance of face coverings on public transport actually has a real impact uh, on the pandemic so it's it's really important that we're focusing on on getting full compliance i'm not seeing any further uh, hands that are being uh, indicated so i'll just uh, uh, chairman there was a message to Blake. oh yes Yes, yes, of course, James. Is, is Judith there? Um, hi, sorry, Liam. I don't seem to have a hand raising function on my iPad. Oh, OK. Uh, I've had this problem before with two, the Teams stuff, so I have to put in a comment. Just um, um, I think um, I think what we've got to try and um, do, and certainly we're doing it through our local outbreak board, is actually really address the issue about communication, because I think... Um, you know, confidence um, amongst so many people is very low and most people are compliant and they don't want to go into a situation that they don't understand what is expected of them. Um, so I just can't emphasise enough how important it is um, to keep repeating the messages about what what's happening. So when, you know, when people arrive at a station, it's very clear um, exactly where they have to go, you know, if they have to... Um, stand, you know, queue and, 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 you know, I think, you know, talking to so many people, their first experience of doing something that they haven't done for three or four months is actually quite, quite daunting. Um, and, um, you know, they don't want to be in a position where they get um, into trouble or shouted at because they've done the wrong thing. So 
I just think we, I hope um, the operators are working with communication teams, with behavioural scientists, all of the um, resource that we have available to to make it as um, comfortable as possible for people who are returning. And of course, the, the difficulty is that that very first message, uh, you know, don't use public transport if you can possibly avoid it, I'm afraid, is, is really stuck. Um, and uh, that will continue pre to present us with problems. So there has to be um, really clear uh, visual um, assistance and maybe um, you know the operators we need to work together to think about putting some adverts on television or something that can actually show people what a journey now looks like and what's expected of them um, but I think it's going to take a long time um, and um, you know sort of talking to some operators the predictions in terms of returning to where we were it could take anything between two and ten years. I mean, it's it's a really dramatic situation that we're in. But I think the more that people start to go out for other reasons, um, then confidence grows. And um, clearly, if more and more people are using the roads, they're going to become pretty difficult to, to navigate. So it will give an incentive for, to get people back onto public transport again. Thanks, Judith. I've got uh, Louise from TP and then I think Nick from Northern that want to respond to that. Louise? Yes, thanks, Leah. I just wanted to also echo um, the feedback that Anna Jane and um, Nick gave around face coverings and retail, sorry, and Richard gave. Um, and in relation to um, what Councillor Blake just said, we absolutely feel the need to help reinforce and also um, encourage and give reassurance to customers. We've done a number of videos um, of, of what customers can expect to see at our stations and on board our trains and we're promoting those via all of our communication channels on our website and on our social media. We've done those as well for customers who require additional assistance at stations to again help them understand what arrangements we've got in place to keep them and colleagues safe so we'd be happy to work as well and with others to see if there are any other ways in which we can use these tools to give that reassurance. Nick? So uh, just to build on uh, Louise's point there, a very similar collateral that we have in place, um, a couple of points I'd make. The, all of the survey work that we've done suggests, and this might not be surprising to members, that the single most important thing to get people back to travelling by public transport is around confidence, it's around confidence for their own safety in this environment. Um, and actually that, um, that runs ahead of pricing, uh, very interestingly, and some of the work even suggests that free public transport would not get people back um, as quickly as, as delivering confidence in, uh, in the safety space. So um, that is a, a very key area of focus for us, and we're ready to run with uh, quite a significant amount of collateral on this. And I think the, the balancing point that I would just uh, share is clearly the message um, that we're being guided through from uh, government at the moment continues to um, exercise a degree of caution, should I say, in terms of returning to public transport. The essential travel message has been dropped and softened somewhat, but a degree of caution is still there as the, the core message. So we are um, being very careful at balancing the encouraging of people to come back to public transport against that, uh, that national message, um, which uh, we all hope will will relieve over time because um, absolutely we need to get the volumes back for many, many reasons um, in terms of the, the social mobility piece that, that rail and public transport brings as well as the financial positions of, uh, for the network. Anna Jane, do you want to add to that as well? Yeah, I was just going to build on what Nick said um, with, it, with a little example, which I don't mind sharing from, from, from my um, home life. I, for those of you who don't know, I'm third generation railway. So my, my parents are fortunate enough to be retired railway um, staff who have um, free travel until 
until they uh, choose to use it, which is lovely for them. Uh, we don't get that as, a, as the current generation. But anyway, um, even they don't feel confident enough to travel. And, you know, they don't have to pay for it. As Nick says, that, that isn't even enough when they don't have to pay. And they don't usually have all of that interaction to do with, with buying tickets, booking seats, etc. They're usually, you know, the most confident uh, rail travellers that I've probably ever met. They're always on the train. And at the moment, they cannot imagine when it is that they'll feel confident enough to travel by rail. And I think that's a really stark, slightly humorous, but, but real example of how... If, if we're struggling to get confidence in those type of um, passengers, then it, it's really it's really a big challenge that we've got to, to encourage people who are already less confident. And, and, and as Nick says, have got other barriers towards travel that exists in any event. So um, we are working together and the, the messaging is softening and that's the first step. And we've got a long way to go, but it is a very collaborative industry effort and it's not where any of us want to be. The, those of us who feel passionately about public transport and rail in particular, it goes against everything we believe in to, to want to not have people use, use our products and our services. So, um, yeah, it's very much we want to move forward from that in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, thanks, Anna Jane. I think that's actually a really good practical example of how yeah, people are literally feeling uh, around it at this moment in time. Well, I'll just sort of sum up um, as well from, from my perspective. I was really pleased that Anna Jane mentioned particularly the work that Northern are doing around uh, school children that, that use the, the train. Obviously, most kids in the North don't use the train to, to get to and from school, but in significant pockets they do. It's absolutely vital that as and when they do return to school, uh, that that's done in a completely safe and secure environment and really pleased to hear about the focused approach that's, that's happening in those areas where there is significant school uh, traffic. Um, I'd also like to put on, thank, on record my thanks uh, for all the collective efforts across uh, the railway industry, all of you as the, the management function. I th also think we need to flag up the really important role the trade unions have been playing uh, to step up to the plate and make sure that we're delivering a safe and secure railway for everyone that works on it, but crucially all those people that need to, to travel around. Uh, but the final point really is the one that Keith made, uh, that all of this takes additional resources. Uh, you know, COVID has changed uh, many, many things completely. Yeah, in certain respects, that's an opportunity to reset some of the challenges of the railway. But one of the problems it gives us is an even greater financial headache. The government at the start of this crisis said they would provide whatever was required. Uh, there can be no backsliding on that whatsoever. And certainly Transport for the North will continue to consistently and loudly make that argument about getting the required resources for the, the rail network that we need across the north of England in the short term and certainly definitely into the long term as well. So if we can note all of that uh, discussion reports and obviously bring back uh, future reports as required at future meetings that would be be great if we can then move on to uh, item five which is the blake jones uh, review update and judith you're going to take us through this okay thank you chair um the um, um the paper i think is quite um straightforward and self-explanatory so um i just want to say actually a lot of the issues that we've been discussing through Blake Jones and Passenger Promise actually were picked up in the previous item and I don't think we've had such a ever could have thought we'd have such a stark example of just how putting the passengers at the centre of everything we do in the industry um, you know is just such an important element and I'm really pleased that the operators and um, Network Rail have picked up on that strand and um, but it's you know we have to be vigilant and make sure that that um, that continues. Um, so I'm, um, I'm pleased that we're getting more visibility around the partnership uh, board work. Um, and again, you know, this, this is a, the area that we really have to make sure we um, work hard. Um, there, there's obviously um, some concern, um, if, I'm, if I'm honest, you know, just um, obviously there's a lot of a lot happening in the franchising space. Um, and um, we need to make sure that we're fully up to speed. Um, obviously, we've got the operator of last resort um, on Northern, um, but it is an area that we need to look at, keep looking at very carefully. Um, and um, I think there is a concern um, as to where we are with the, the Williams review work coming out. 
and and into a place where we can actually assess it. And uh, I think there is um, a fear that it might never actually see the light of day in its full form. And I think that actually holds some concerns for us in terms of, of our ambition around um, devolution and around particularly more local accountability and more control. I think, um, if I can be honest, in certain areas we have seen um, an increasing reluctance from um, DFT to share the necessary detail of information with us, and I think that is a very much um, would be a backward step. And um, I would have hoped that, uh, you know, with all of the fallout from the timetable disaster and then going forward into the recovery phase that we're now going into um, and that um, that um, Whitehall would um, understand just how important we are um, at a local level to help move um, this forward. So um, the main thing I would like to say, Chair, is that we're seeking an urgent meeting with Chris Heaton-Harris as the Minister responsible, hopefully before the recess. Um, he's um, in conversations with him um, around the side of meetings. He's been very keen to be involved and to help us take this forward. But I'm, I'm seeking a formal meeting with him so that he can pick up the elements that we know are so important um, to the future of the rail industry going forward. So. Um, I know I, um, we've got the support of the um, committee in this work, and I just want to reassure everyone that it's very much at the, um, the forefront um, of, uh, of, our, of our work. And I think we have seen some really important developments, and the, the much closer working with Network Rail, as I've said, is, um, is to be welcomed. And obviously, if we follow through with our aspirations in terms of um, enhancements and improvements to the network, then that relationship is absolutely going to be pivotal. So I hope um, at the next meeting I'll be able to report back on a successful meeting with um, with Chris or indeed at the next TFN meeting, because hopefully it'll be before, before then. So um, we should have um, something a bit more substantial to report back on. Brilliant. Thanks, Judith. And I don't know if there's any questions or comments anyone wants to raise other than to thank Judith for the exceptional work she's done on this um, work strand for the past couple of years in extremely difficult circumstances and warmly endorse everything that's in there. Andy. To echo what you've just said, uh, Chair, and to thank Judith for everything that she's done. But just to, to um, really support her in seeking clarity from the government on the status of the Williams review. Um, it does seem to have kind of slipped into the sidings uh, a little, and, and I think we need to get it out of there and really reaffirm our full support uh, for it um, and want to, to know its status, basically. I, in the paper, it suggests, you know, priorities for devolution, accountability, decentralisation, transparency. Chair, I would always stress integration. You know, if, if all of us as the cities of the north have ambitions for London style transport systems, devolution allows a breaking down of the silos between um, the way the different transport modes operate. And I think whenever we talk about Williams, I think it's really important to stress um, the, the, the benefits of an integrated transport system across all modes as a, as a reason for supporting the Williams review. So it's not devolution for the sake of it. It's devolution to get us to a, a very different transport system of the kind that uh, London has. Absolutely. If we're happy to uh, endorse and agree all the points from item five, then I'm not seeing any dissent. So we can move on to uh, to item six, which is the, the rail reform and devolution uh, paper, which nicely leads through not just from what uh, Judith's just presented, but Andy's said. And, and Judith, I think you're just going to take us through that paper as well. Yes, um, um, I, I think we've we've covered quite a, a bit of it. Um, so sort of covering the two items together in a way, I think they're absolutely um, intertwined. Um, but um, again, I think, you know, just at every opportunity, we have to emphasise just how important um, um, devolution is to actually helping us to get through the current the current crisis, whether it's just limited to the 
um, as Adam said, integration of public transport across um, across the north um, to that the role of that in the um, the economic resetting recovery, whatever um, we need to um, to d discuss it, and um, we must make sure that those are fully intertwined and intertwined and um, um, I think I might have just um, developed a new word there. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, we're talking, you know, obviously a lot of us are involved in calls with business leaders almost on a daily basis. And they're very much, um, you know, what they want to be involved in understanding what the future of um, public transport is in terms of their planning um, going forward. Um, also, um, the um, the old chestnut, really, you know, the resources, the money, the budget, you know, what actually are we um, looking forward to as we go into the autumn with um, um, the spending review, but also so much talk about um, accelerating infrastructure spend um, in the north. I think um, we need to make sure that we're absolutely on the same page with government when it comes to talking about priorities, um, working, you know, building on all the work we've done over over the years we've been setting up transport for the north um, um, going forward. Um, but, um, you know, I think I think we still have work to do around the um, the issue of um, transparency. And, you know, we've um, the whole um, work we've been doing about making sure that this committee is the sovereign body, if you like, in the partnership. Um, we need to make sure that that continues um, at pace so that we have all of the information um, that we need so we can um, make informed um, decisions. Um, and it's absolutely crucial as we go forward. And I think we know that um, everything that's been happening over the last three or four months means that, um, that the model of um, service delivery is, just got, is going to have to change and uh, we want to make sure that locally we're absolutely um, at the heart of um, the conversations now and the decisions that are going to be made um, and how we can take it forward. So I'll leave it there, Chair, and happy to listen to comments from other people. Brilliant. Thanks, Judith. David, I know you wanted to, to come in. Just to uh, say, Chair, that we will pick up the point on, on integration because members are, are quite right that this was at the heart of the, uh, the Blake Jones review, integration with local uh, transport facilities and also integration of, of track and train. So I think that is important. We can make sure that's uh, uh, absolutely built in. I think the plan is to, to take this item forward um, initially with that meeting planned with the minister that Councillor Blake mentioned as the next, uh, next first step here. A lot of this is about baking in what I think we've heard some very good joint working with the operators in the industry during the COVID crisis. And uh, I think the key thing we want to emphasise is not to not to lose that, actually to build on it. And there's been some really good cooperation uh, from the operators in that in that period. So just to reassure you, we'll pick up the integration point. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, David. And I'm not seeing any other kind of indications, but I strongly, strongly support this whole paper because for me, it's a no brainer at the end of the day. The, the ultimate sort of uh, aim we should have for this is getting all of those railway services across the north of England devolved uh, to the north and actually, where possible, devolving them further for service uh, delivery to the local constituent areas and then making sure that's properly funded with a, a proper rail grant from, from government. I say that with deep, deep conviction because here in the Liverpool city region where I'm sat, we've been doing that with Mersey Rail for years and it worked really, really well than the alternative when it was managed from a far off place called London. So for me, this is something that is a no brain uh, that we've got to doggedly pursue and make sure comes into being whatever happens with, with Williams and whenever that, that comes about. So strongly support this and I'm sure everyone across the, the committee will do equally as well. And I'm not seeing any shaking of heads. So if we can take that as a, a complete endorsement and, and make sure that sort of Judith gets that meeting with Chris Heaton Harris or Grant Shapps as soon as possible to crack on with this. Brilliant. Okay. If we can then uh, move on. Um, 
Uh, now is item seven, uh, which is just procedurally to um, agree the date of the next uh, meeting on the forthcoming meeting date. The next one will be Wednesday, the 21st of October, and forthcoming dates uh, will be Tuesday, the 12th of January, and Wednesday, the 17th of March. Hopefully, at some point, we will also be able to, to come and meet in a room all together in a traditional sense, as well as doing it uh, digitally, as we have been uh, been doing. If we can agree uh, those uh, accordingly uh, with the potential for a further meeting uh, on the 23rd of June 2021 as well so again not seeing a dissent so I shall take that as read now we're going to have to move into the private session so item uh, eight is for me to uh, move the relevant uh, motion from the local government act 1972 uh, to actually kind of exclude press and public so if we can agree that accordingly and that call, then falls for me to ask has the the public broadcast been turned off 